it's time for another Q&A session so I can answer all the questions you guys have been asking me here on YouTube. Hey guys, Liz from The Nail Hub here. And today is going to be our second Q&A session for this Nails Fundamental playlist that I've been doing. I hope these videos are really helping you and I've gotten some really positive feedback from a lot of you who are going through the entire series. If you haven't started from the beginning, I really encourage you to go back to the first video and start from scratch because a lot of the questions I'm getting asked now in some of these later videos are things that I've already answered in previous ones. However, I wanted to take some time today to do another Q&A session to go through some of the really good questions I've gotten asked here on the channel and clarify some things that I think could be discussed a little bit more. All right, so first off, we have a question from my how to make a perfect gel nail cleanser video. And the question is, can I ask why you use alcohol and why acetone? And why not just one of those? I've noticed some brands make their cleanser mainly from one of those ingredients, but not sure why or what's best. Okay, so this is a really good question. There are tons of manufacturers who make their own nail cleansers and also soak off solutions. And if you work with a particular line, you can definitely just use the liquids that come with that particular system. If you remember from my how to make perfect gel nail cleanser video, I talked about how some gel nail cleansers and soak off solutions can actually have incompatibility with other product lines. And so if you're someone like me who likes to use lots of different things, I actually make my own gel nail cleanser. All right, let's clarify what alcohol is for. We use isopropyl alcohol, especially here in the United States. Um, that's what we are able to get our hands on as far as a bacteria killing agent. And so we use isopropyl alcohol to kill surface bacteria. This allows us to make sure that the nail plate is perfectly clean before we put any product on top of it. And it eliminates the risk of getting things like pseudomonas, other types of bacteria trapped on the nail inside of the product. So that is for killing bacteria. Acetone is for stripping oil. So acetone is a great dehydrator. It dissolves oils on the surface of the nail plate. It can also be used to take off, soak off gel polish or nail polish, but acetone is really excellent as a dehydrator. So if you go back and you watch my how to make perfect gel nail cleanser video, you'll see I mix mostly IPA or isopropyl alcohol to kill bacteria on the nails and fingers I'm working on and a little bit of acetone to work as a dehydrator in my gel cleanser to help me strip off those surface oils that might inhibit adhesion with the products that I use. Okay, so that is the whole goal with doing IPA and acetone together. They do separate things, but yes, you're right. A lot of gel cleansers on the market, if you look at the list of ingredients, you will see isopropyl alcohol and you'll also see acetone mixed in there, but a lot of them include scent, color, other things that might inhibit adhesion. So I like to just strip it down, make it really, really simple, and just use IPA and acetone all by themselves. Okay, second question regarding the how to make a perfect gel nail cleanser video. Can I use ethanol instead of alcohol? I can't find alcohol in my country. All right, so I did a little bit of research on this and a lot of you were asking me about different foreign countries and what is the equivalent of isopropyl alcohol in other places. So what I found is denatured ethanol is basically the same thing as isopropyl alcohol, except it's under a different name. Again, the goal with isopropyl alcohol is to remove surface bacteria. So if denatured alcohol is what a doctor would use in your country before you get a shot and they clean your arm before they stick the needle in, then denatured ethanol is going to be what you would use instead of isopropyl alcohol. Another great way to see what is actually being used is to check out a nail cleanser from your country and see on the list of ingredients, does it say denatured ethanol instead of isopropyl alcohol? But again, the whole point of using isopropyl alcohol is to kill surface bacteria. So you're gonna want something that is the equivalent of that in your country. Um, unfortunately, I can't speak for every country in the world, but I have found through my research that denatured ethanol is basically the same thing, if not the same thing. Okay, we also have some questions about the nail safety, how to prevent injuries, overexposure, and nail infections video. Hi Liz, thank you for this. Can I ask, how do you store your clean disinfected tools? Thanks. Okay, I'm gonna show you exactly how I store my clean disinfected tools. So I actually use one of these plastic boxes. 
Um, they are super cheap. You can get them from literally any beauty supply store. I usually just walk into any of the typical physical stores and buy these. They're usually a dollar a piece, maybe a little bit less, a little bit more. They do have holes in the top, so even though it closes, it allows air to escape out of the box. And I also put, usually, this is just my personal one, um, but usually I'll put some label tape on it that says clean implements or clean tools. And then I also have some other ones that I use for dirty. That way if I'm traveling or I'm working, I can make sure that my drawers aren't getting gross and that the clean and dirty are perfectly separated. So I use these little implement boxes and I'll put a link to um, some of the places that I've seen them online, but usually the cheapest place to get them rather than paying shipping for something that costs a dollar is to buy a whole bunch of them on eBay or to walk into one of those typical beauty supply stores and just buy a whole bunch of them. They're usually like a dollar. Okay, next question. Let's see. Hey there, I'm also using an ultrasonic bath with a special disinfectant solution. I know how long to leave the tools in it and I wash them before. My question is how often do I have to renew the solution? I have two clients a day. Do I have to have a second bath for my tools I use for pedicures? Okay, so let me answer the first part of this question. So how often do you have to renew the solution? Well, again, it really depends on how many clients you're doing a day. Some manufacturers like Barbicide, for example, have some recommendations as to how often you should be renewing your quad solution. Um, and Barbicide is an example of a quartz solution. I would suggest if you're doing more than four people a day, you renew your Barbicide or quartz solution daily. Okay, so renew your disinfectant solution daily. Um, I usually keep a jar of it so that I can submerge all of my tools completely. Or you can use uh, like my ultrasonic bath that I have. Um, I would replace that liquid, that liquid disinfectant on a daily basis and make a fresh batch every single morning before I get started or you could do it every single night. I usually do every single morning because I don't leave tools in there overnight. I only leave them in for the recommended amount of time. And then every morning I would make a new batch. And when I had, um, when I was working in a salon full time, we actually had a big, big tub that we would use to submerge all of our tools that had a lid on it. And we would renew that every single morning. That was one of our opening procedures for the salon. So um, that is a really good question. If you're only doing maybe one or two people a day, you could probably get away with doing uh, maybe every four days you renew your solution. Um, something like that. The things you want to look for are, does it start to turn milky or murky? Um, you know, as soon as the liquid starts to look semi-opaque, it means that it's been contaminated by soap or something else. And also, if you've got any type of debris floating in your quad solution, you definitely want to replace it. Uh, things like dirt, fingernail clippings, anything like that that gets into your quad solution can actually inactivate your quad solution and make it not work anymore. So you just wanna make sure that your quad solution is nice and fresh and clean, and that way it's going to work effectively on your tools. Okay, um, second part of that question is, do I have to have a second bath for tools I use for pedicures? No, you don't. You can actually uh, sanitize both your manicure and pedicure tools at the same time. The only reason why you might want to separate them is just to keep them separated so that you know, hey, these are my toenail clippers, these are my fingernail clippers, or these are the nippers I use for hands, these are the nippers I use for feet, like maybe you have different sizes. Um, so yeah, I mean, if you have special tools you like to use for pedicures, you can absolutely keep them separated throughout the whole entire sanitization process. But you don't actually have to do that in order to make sure that your tools get clean. This, the liquid disinfectant will clean all of your tools as long as they're washed, rinsed, um, and ready to go before they go inside of your quads, okay? So you don't have to do that. You could just do it for organizational purposes. Okay, next question is, Liz, thank you so much for making this video. As a DIYer, it is super hard to find information on this topic, although I still do have a couple of questions. If I'm just sanitizing a few tools, do I have to use two ounces of Barbicide with 32 ounces of water, or can I change the ratio and do one ounce of Barbicide and 16 ounces of water? My other question is, what does the role of disinfecting machine do? Could I just put the Barbicide and water into another container and let it sit? If the role of the disinfecting machine is important, does anyone, does anyone work? or are some cheap ones off of Amazon not as good? Also, how long do you let your tools sit in Barbicide for them to be completely disinfected? Thank you so much. Okay, so this is a three-part question. This is a really good question, so I appreciate you asking this. 
Um, absolutely. So the ratio of 32, so like it depends on what disinfectant you're using. Every disinfectant has a different mix ratio. Barbicide, for example, is 32 ounces of water to two ounces of barbicide solution. You can absolutely half that or quarter it if you want to, as long as the ratio stays the same. Okay. So if it's 16 to one, you would want to make sure that it's 16 to one, no matter what type of amounts that you're using, that same ratio can absolutely be applied. Um, so yeah, you can make smaller, uh, you can make smaller uh, batches of your quad solution. Totally. Just make sure you follow that same manufacturer ratio, depending on the manufacturer that you use for your liquid disinfectant, because not all of them are exactly the same. Some of them are like one cap full per gallon. Um, it just depends on, you know, their instructions. Okay. Second part of this question is, um, what does the role of the disinfecting machine do? So I think what they're referring to here is my ultrasonic cleaner. Um, I like using the ultrasonic cleaner because I find that it helps to get that quat solution in between all of those little nooks and crannies in my tools. Um, and it kind of shakes everything to make sure that anything that didn't get dislodged does come out. Um, so I really like using that. I also like it because it's small. It fits on my table. It's got a lid on it. Uh, I don't know. I just, I really like using the ultrasonic cleaner. It has like a little basket in it. It's very convenient for me, but no, you don't have to use an ultrasonic cleaner with your disinfectant solution. You can even just use like a Tupperware tub or a glass jar. I typically recommend you use something that is plastic. Um, because glass, if you've ever purchased one of those really pretty like barbicide tube glass, like um, they have like a little pulling thing that you can pull out the tools on the, on the little rack and it's all glass like beaker looking thing. The only thing I have found is when I have accidentally dropped a bit or something, like let's say I'm trying to put the bit in my quad solution and it slips through the hole and it drops all the way down to the bottom of the beaker. I've actually had my tools crack the glass and all of my barbicide leak out overnight. So I prefer plastic or metal so that I know that the glass isn't going to break or crack and that my barbicide solution isn't going to leak out. But no, you don't have to use an ultrasonic cleaner. Okay. Third part of this question. Um, if it is important, um, let's see, can you just put it in some other th container? If, it, if the disinfecting machine is important, can you get any type of, yes, absolutely. You can literally use almost any type of container. As long as the container is dedicated to your quad solution, it has a lid on it. I definitely recommend a lid because you don't want any type of stuff getting inside of your quad solution. So you can use, like I said, a Tupperware with a lid. Um, you can use all kinds of containers for barbicide. And, uh, and if you're in, if you have any questions or you're in doubt about something, I would recommend calling up the manufacturer of your disinfectant and asking them, Hey, what kinds of containers can I use to disinfect my tools? That's a great question for the manufacturer. Okay. Next question, Liz, you are the bomb. I've been using my ultrasonic cleaner with leukocide, scrubbing it in Dawn and hot water first. My question is I've been rinsing my tools after they've been in leukocide underwater to rinse off the solution. Is this okay? or should I just lay them on my paper towel to dry and not rinse them? Thank you. Um, this totally depends on the disinfectant solution. Some solutions I have seen, you are not supposed to rinse them. You're supposed to just um, lay them out nicely and let them air dry. Uh, but some solutions I have seen that they recommend rinsing it off so it doesn't continue to eat away at your tools. Some of the disinfectant solutions can be pretty, pretty hefty. They can actually dull bits. Um, or even eat away at certain grades of stainless steel. They can rust things over time. So it really depends on the solution you're working with. I recommend checking out the manufacturer instructions. And if it says rinse your implements after they've been in the solution, then go ahead and rinse them. Um, and again, these disinfectant solutions or quad solutions are very caustic. Um, so we don't want to get them on our skin and they can also be carcinogenic, which means if you get them on your skin for prolonged periods of time, you know, they're known to cause cancer. So you want to make sure that when you are handling your tools, you are either using tongs to pick them up and let them air dry. Um, cause you don't want to touch the liquid disinfectant with your bare hands. So I usually use dish gloves. I'll wear dish gloves that are dedicated for my cleaning stuff or I'll, I'll wear nitrile gloves. And I also usually use tongs or a basket of some kind to get my tools out of my quad solution without touching the actual solution. But please read your manuf manufacturer instructions for each disinfectant that you're using to make sure that you're cleaning them properly and also following any post, uh, post sanitization procedures like rinsing them, air drying, etc. Okay. Next question on the list still regarding our nail safety video. 
Does it ha uh, sorry, does it matter how long you keep the tools in the barbicide or should you let them sit for the appropriate time? Dry them and then store them in your implement drawer. Also, is it okay to use alcohol just to clean your table surface? Very informative video. I love and appreciate that you're so willing to help and teach us nail techs keep teach us. Most nail techs keep the secrets to themselves. Okay. Um, so again, this is a very long winded question and these are great questions. I actually love it when you guys ask me these very involved questions. Um, okay. So does it matter how long you keep the tools in barbicide? Yes, it absolutely does. You have to leave the tools in barbicide for the recommended amount of time. And as I recall off the top of my head, it is 12 minutes. I could be wrong on that. Um, but check the instructions. So every time you buy barbicide or leucocide or any of those other disinfectant solutions, it'll have instructions as to how long the tools need to be exposed in order to kill all of the viruses and bacteria that may be on them. Um, so you want to leave your tools in for that exact amount of time because if you do it too short, you're not going to kill everything that's on your tools. If you do it too long, you may actually be impacting your tools. You may be rusting them. You may be dulling them. You may be having adverse side effects that are going to, you know, um, that are going to shorten the longevity of your implements and your other tools that you sanitize. So it's really important to follow that exact instructions and also follow the exact amount of time. I usually just put like a timer on my phone or like if you have an Alexa or a Google, um, you know, Google home, just say, Hey, put a timer on for how long you need to be sanitizing your implements. And I usually don't do it throughout the day. This also makes your life much easier. I usually have a dirty container in my drawer. I put all of my dirty tools in my drawer as I'm working. And then I do my whole washing and sanitization procedure at the very end of the day. Okay. You could also do it in the morning, but I usually do it at the end of the day while I'm cleaning up or whatever. I sanitize, I wash, sanitize my tools first, put them in the solution. Then I go and I clean up everything else. And when my timer goes off, I go, I take my tools out and I let them air dry overnight. So that allows you to be prepped for the next day. Um, but I actually own enough tools to do seven, eight clients a day. I can go through the whole day and then sanitize everything at the end of the day. I find that to be much more efficient than trying to do it throughout your appointments. And then you're forgetting that your tools were in there all day or you leave them in there overnight. And pretty soon your bits get dull, your nippers get dull, they might get rusted. So I recommend following the exact manufacturer, manufacturer instructions for whatever disinfectant solution that you're purchasing. Okay, so that's the beginning of that. So it does absolutely matter. Um, and yes, you would want to dry them and store them in a clean container. Usually, I don't recommend just putting them in a drawer. Drawers tend to get dust inside of them over time. They're not exactly like a clean, you know, kind of encapsulated safe area for your tools. Um, some people like to store their tools in like one of those UV uh, cabinets but I usually recommend you disinfect your tools before you store them in there because it's kind of like a preventive thing. It's not an actual sanitization thing. Um, some people, like I said, you can store them in those plastic boxes like I have that are just labeled clean tools and you can separate them like nippers or whatever. I've also done before where each box is a set of implements for each given appointment. So you can have, you know, sets of tools that are all uh, kind of segregated out for each individual appointment. And that way you have like eight boxes of tools and then each, you know, each new service, you have your clean box of tools. I don't usually reach for tools right out of my drawer when I'm working in the salon. I like to make sure that everything is compartmentalized, everything is clean and everything is protected. So yeah, you do wanna um, put them in a clean, dry space. And also the other key point, if you remember from my video, is make sure that they have access to air. Because if you trap slightly moist tools in an oxygen free environment, it actually can cause things to grow on them. So you want to make sure that there's also air circulation holes in something or whatever to allow those tools to remain dry. Okay. Um, okay. So second part of this question is, is it okay to use alcohol to clean your table surface? Yeah, sure. I've used rubbing alcohol to clean my table. Um, it'll kill the surface bacteria on it. You can also use your same quad solution in a spray bottle to clean down your table. That's also a great idea. Um, and there's also other disinfectant solutions like Lysol wipes. You can use a bleach and water uh, mixture to clean your table. Depends on the material that your table's made out of, but I've definitely used things like Lysol or Clorox wipes or stuff like that to wipe down my table in between clients and just make sure that it's nice and clean before my next customer comes. I also use table towels. So usually the client is not touching the actual table surface. I have like a nice clean table 
towel laid out and then I put a table towel over that so I can work on that um, and that also protects my table surface. Um, okay, so, and then what was the other part of it? Very informative video, blah, blah, blah. Oh, and thanks for sharing. So I hope that helps. Um, yeah, it's, it's very important to follow the instructions that come with your specific disinfectant and, uh, and just make sure things are nice and clean and dry. And the more you do on the prevention side, the safer your services are going to be and you're going to stay safe. And so are your clients. All right. Next up also about nail safety. Could you touch on UV sterilizers that have become available or recently become available? Will this replace the barbicide step? Okay. Um, if you actually Google UV sterilization, it does exist. And it's actually a technology that's typically used for sterilizing water. So for cleaning water to make it drinkable or potable, um, there is such a thing as UV sterilization. However, from what I have seen in the nail industry, the UV sterilizer cabinets that exist are not actually powerful enough to sterilize your tools. And I know this is confusing because they do say UV sterilizer on them. And if you remember from my nail safety video, sterilization is the complete elimination of all you know, negative things on something like all viruses, all bacteria, all molds, all whatever, all contaminants are removed through the process of heat, pressure together. Okay. So heat and pressure together is how we sterilize tools. Like in an autoclave, an autoclave uses heat with steam and also pressure in a pressurized uh, container inside of a, a like a, a pressurized uh, room or a chamber to actually sterilize those tools. A UV sterilizer cabinet does not use heat and it does not use pressure. Therefore, it cannot sterilize those tools, okay? Now, one thing I wanted to go into really quick, and I'm just gonna read this off because I wanted to write down exactly what I was gonna say. So chemical disinfectants like the EPA registered ones that I talked about, um, and EPA registered is basically the same thing as hospital grade chemical disinfectants are the ones that I mentioned that destroy and damage cell membranes of microorganisms and kill them by chemical process, okay? So we're basically killing the outside membrane of a bacteria or inhibiting the virus from being able to reproduce. And that's how we kill the actual viruses and bacteria through chemicals. In contrast, when bacteria and viruses are exposed to the germicidal wavelengths of ultraviolet light, they become incapable of reproducing and infecting. So it basically neutralizes them. It also is under heavy review that UV light exposure may only make bacteria and viruses dormant and may not actually kill them. In my mind, the most surefire way to kill everything is to sterilize via autoclave, but for most salons, using a powerful EPA registered liquid disinfectant is your best bet over UV sterilizers, okay? So be very careful with the whole UV sterilizer thing. Again, I know it says that on the cabinet, but there's a lot of manufacturers, companies, and also people that do not understand the difference between disinfection and sterilization. In most cases, we are only disinfecting. We are trying to remove the majority of contaminants in our area, and we're doing that through chemical process. Sterilization is the complete elimination of those contaminants through using pressure and heat, and UV sterilizers don't do that. But I will add, and I was talking in response to another question on my YouTube channel, that UV sterilizers, those cabinets, are actually a great place to store your clean tools because they do kind of help prevent stuff from getting on your tools. So they do kind of create like a nice clean enclosed environment for your tools. So you could definitely store them in there after they have been disinfected or after they have been sterilized, okay? So that is really important to um, notice that difference. And sanitization is the whole category of cleaning things, right? So sanitization is when we're trying to clean off stuff to make them safe for use. But inside of sanitization, there's the different types, which is disinfection and sterilization. Sterilization being like the, the highest level you can get to. Disinfection is what most of us are doing in the salon and it's enough for what we do, but we have to do it right and we have to do it consistently in order to get the, the benefits out of it, okay? All right, next question. Um, top five gel polish issues and how to fix them. So if you guys remember my top five gel polish issues and how to fix them video, Hi, can I substitute top coat as a base coat? Well, in general, no, you cannot. 
Um, top coat is formulated for shine and also for durability and protection of the product that we have already put on the nail. Base coat is made for adhesion and usually top coat has nothing to do with adhesion. So I would not sub top coat for base coat. There are some gels that are base coat, top coat, universal products that can be used for both. But again, I find in general, okay, this is a big generalization because there are some products that do this really, really well. In general, a product that is a base and a top coat at the same time, they usually don't work as well, okay? Reason being is because they're trying to do so many things at the same time. They're trying to create shine, they're trying to create durability, but they're also trying to create adhesion. And usually they're not flexible enough for a base coat, they don't adhere as well as a base coat, and oftentimes they're also difficult to remove. So I do not sub top coats for base coats. I usually use a three-part system, which is base coat, and then whatever I'm gonna put in the middle, and then top coat, okay? So I like the three-part system because it allows the products to specialize at what they're doing, and I find that those products usually work better than universal products that try to do it all. Next question, is there such a thing as overcuring? Sometimes I leave it longer to double check. Yes, there is such a thing as overcuring. Um, however, I would say that undercuring is the bigger problem. Undercuring is the bigger problem because when we have uncured product, obviously we get the immediate breakdown of the service, we get the peeling, we get the bubbling. Um, it may be too rubbery, it may break, it may crack, it may crumble, depending on what the situation is. The other issue with undercuring is that we are leaving undercured product on the nail, which means it is not fully polymerized, and that can actually lead to allergic reactions. So undercuring in my mind is the bigger of the two problems. Overcuring, however, does absolutely exist. Um, when you overcure things, some of the side effects can be yellowing because you're overactivating the photo initiators in your gel. It can also make the gel too brittle because you're over polymerizing the product. And so the bonds come together and they form, but then they kind of get baked way too long. Imagine like baking a cake longer than it's supposed to be. It starts to dry out. It starts to get really crumbly. Same idea with gels. So over curing, yes, you can absolutely have some side effects. However, in my experience with most of the products that I've used, the biggest side effect is the yellowing. I have not noticed a huge difference in brittleness, in durability. Um, my products are, you know, my products or my services don't break down if I slightly over cure. And again, when I'm talking about over curing, I'm talking about like, you know, the, the bottle says 30 seconds and you do a minute, right? I mean, an extra 30 seconds isn't gonna kill you. Um, but there are some side effects and you're basically using the product outside of the manuf manufacturer's instructions. So you may have some, some minor side effects to that, like yellowing of the product. Um, it typically also happens with products that are very high in solvents. Usually like it'll overactivate the gel polish. It'll start to eat the pigment. Uh, you might get color change of the actual product. Um, it can make some of the things more brittle, like I said. Um, and you might, you know, instead of having something last three weeks, it might only last two. Like that might be the, the situation. But in my personal experience with a lot of the products that I've tried, um, I have not noticed a huge problem with over curing. So that is, um, that is less of an issue. But yes, it absolutely does exist. Okay, um, let's see here, what is next? So top five gel polish issues and how to fix them. What about shrinking wrinkling when it comes to dark gel polishes? For example, my black gel polish always shrinks and wrinkles even when I attempt to flash cure. I've been able to mostly fix it with my top coat, but of course I'd like to be able to avoid that issue altogether if possible. Any suggestions? Okay. So if we go back to me talking about um, how gel cures, and if you remember from my lamp video, I talked about the differences between CFL bulbs and LED bulbs and how the UV light penetrates and also the different spectrum of ultraviolet light that we're using. And if you haven't watched this video, I really recommend you do because it's gonna illuminate a lot of, not, no pun intended, it's gonna illuminate a lot of um, these questions that you might have about how gel cures. The problem with really darkly pigmented gels and also the, on the flip side, really, really chalky colors, like if you have one of those white out white gels, um, the pigments that are used in super, super dark products and also super, super chalky white ones or chalky pinks is that the pigment itself can block the light from penetrating and activating the gel. And a lot of manufacturers, especially I would say manufacturers who don't produce their own gels, 
what they do is they use the same clear gel and they just mix different pigments in it. So the same clear base, or not base coat, but like the same base gel that they're using, the same like core gel, I guess is a better word. The same core gel, they're just mixing different pigments in it. Now that gel might need to be adjusted to cure better for black or for white or for red or for yellow. Usually I would say that yellow, like crayon, you know, Crayola crayon yellow, fire engine red, black, super chalky white, and also neon pigments, those five are actually the most difficult to cure. Just because the type of pigment that's used, it actually can cause blockage of the light from being able to cure the products. So manufacturers who actually formulate their own products typically realize this and they'll tweak the actual core gel formula to be able to cure black, right? Or to cure white because they know that they need either more photo initiators or something that's gonna carry that chemical reaction, that polymerization all the way through the product, regardless of whether the light is able to penetrate the full entire nail. So imagine, imagine like a, a gel polish formula where you've got, um, imagine it's like a, a chain of matches, okay? So we've got all these matches lined up, like a domino effect. If we light the one match on the very, very end, the other matches are gonna catch on fire, right? That's basically what it looks like when the photo initiators carry that polymerization process through the gel. So if one area is blocked, like let's say I've got you know this over the matches and only this match is lit, these matches will still burn even underneath this because it just carries the reaction through. If the formula has a match here, a match here, a match here, a match here, and photo initiators and monomers work like matches, um, then they're not gonna catch on fire between each other because this match is gonna burn and none of the other ones are going to because this one's not touching anything. Does that make sense? So it really comes down to the formula of the gel and if your gel is immediately wrinkling on the surface, even when you're doing thinner coating, it could be two things. It could be the gel formula just doesn't have enough um, photo initiators in it to carry that polymerization through the product it could also be that the lamp that you're using is not powerful enough. So for example, if you remember my CFL lamp analogy, I was talking about how it kind of glows around the gel and it slowly cures the gel from the outside in. Um, if it's a gel that's formulated mainly for LED use, which is going to penetrate that black gel and cure it from the inside out, and really with your CFL lamp, you're curing it from the outside in, or with a low power lamp, you're curing it from the outside in, what you're gonna get is that first crust of gel, that first little tiny layer of gel is gonna cure immediately, but the inside of the gel is not going to cure, and that's also gonna block the full layer from curing, okay? I know this is like really complicated, but if you think about it kind of like baking cake, right? Baking cake, sometimes it's like the outside cooks first and it's still gooey in the center. That's kind of what's happening. But now with modern technology, like a microwave, we're able to shoot those laser beams of energy inside all over and it actually cooks from the inside out. And also with convection ovens, we're able to circulate that heat and get everything to cook evenly. So that's the idea is that your gel might not be cooking evenly um, due to the lamp that you're using, or it could just be that the formula of the gel is not uh, not tweaked in order to be able to cure those particular pigments. In either case, I would recommend you review the gel that you're using and see if it works in other lamps. And then also, um, and then also uh, check out the lamp that you're using. It might not be powerful enough to actually cure the products that you're trying to use. That's usually the two situations with that. Um, okay, let's see here. Hi Liz, do you know what would be the cause of the top coat shattering after three to four days? It has happened three times now on two different clients all on lighter color gel polishes, but I can't for the life of me figure out why it would shatter. Okay, this is a super good question, and I remember exactly how I felt when this first happened to me. I had a client come back that had like this really pretty baby pink color on, and I had put this awesome, no cleanse, super, super shiny top coat on them, and the client came back legit a week later with all these weird lines like it looked like a spider web it looked like shattered glass on her nail and dirt had gotten in between so you could see this weird spider web on top of her nails like it looked like a, a gray spider web because the dirt got in between the cracks and then you can see this weird shattered effect okay 
First part of this is it's not only happening on your light colored gels. The only reason why you can see it is because you're able to see the difference between the light colored color and also the dirt that's getting in between the cracks on your top coat. With darker colors, I guarantee you it's also shattering, but you can't see it because it's a darker color. Part two of this is why it shatters. And I actually just posted a video about this. Um, so the reason why it's shattering is because the top coat is too rigid. It's very glass-like. And so what's happening is you've got this bendy, bendy gel polish nail, and you've got this super, super rigid top coat. And what ends up happening is the gel polish underneath is bending and it goes like that. And the top coat snaps on top of it, dirt gets in between, and then you can see the cracks. So a good way to test this is like I just showed you guys in my Y gel cracks video is that you can test the top coat on a nail form and see if you bend the top coat, does it snap in half right away? And if it does, it's going to be way too rigid for regular gel polish manicures. Those types of top coats really only work well on very, very solid products like hard gels, acrylics, stuff like that. So if you're doing a uh, flexible soak off nails or you're doing natural nail services, get a more flexible top coat. It'll bend and flex with your products and you won't get the shattering. Okay. Um, let's see here. I'm going to take a quick sip of water while I read this next one. What if you use two different brands of products on one nail, which top coat or base gel should you use? This is a great question. Sometimes it comes down to trial and error. Um, I typically use the same top coat for the color that I'm using. Um, and I usually don't mind base coats because the way I work, is, and, and I've shown you guys soak off up until now, and we've been doing really, really basic services, but right after this video, we're gonna get into overlays, we're gonna get into e-filing, we're gonna get into nail enhancements, we're gonna start to get into much more advanced techniques. So just to explain really quick how I do my services and why the base coat to me doesn't matter, whether it's compatible or not. I like to use a base coat that's very, very, uh, creates very, very high adhesion, and that is because I typically do overlays, which means I constantly maintain a layer of clear protective gel. So typically I have my base coat and then I have my hard gel or my builder gel or whatever, whatever protective layer I'm doing. And, and usually these two are fine. They create adhesion and I clean this layer and I finish file it and then I put color and then I put top coat. So for me, the base coat isn't as, as important whether or not it's compatible with my color because typically I don't put my color right on top of the base coat. Um, but that can come down to trial and error. And if you run into issues, um, you know, again, the easiest thing, especially if you're a beginner, the easiest thing is just to use the same base color and top coat from the same brand. That is the easiest. If you want to make your life complicated, like I love to make my life complicated and I love researching products and I love understanding how things work, then yeah, you can absolutely mix and match, but just realize there's going to be some, some trial and error there and you're going to have to really figure out like, does this work with that? And you can usually tell right away if you put color on the base coat and it immediately just blah, 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 like oil on water, it's not compatible. Um, or if you're wearing it on yourself and after a week, the color peels off of the base coat, you might have a compatibility issue there. So I like to keep it as simple as possible, but for me, usually my base and my, my overlay is one section of it, and then I do my color, and then when I do my top coat, I usually use the same brand of top coat as the color layer. And that's because I have found that the biggest issue, more than, more than the base coat, the biggest issue is when the top coat is not compatible with the product right underneath it, and the top coat will, will either chip, peel completely off, it won't be shiny, um, you'll get those pits in it. So I usually use the same top coat for the color layer that I'm doing. I hope that makes sense, okay? If you've got a finished filed nail, like let's say you did a pink and white nail, it's finished filed and it's dry and it's clean, then you can use whatever freaking top coat you want, taking into account flexibility. But if you're talking about like base color top coat, I usually use like one base coat for 99.9% .9 of my stuff unless I've got a color that doesn't work with it. And then I do my color and then I use the same brand of top coat for that color because it just makes things work really well and I get the most longevity out of my services. Um, and then I don't have to worry about removing inhibition layers on every single layer and I don't have to worry about buffing things and I don't have to worry about trial and error on everything. It just keeps life really simple, okay? So I hope that helps. 
Um, how can I prevent that swollen look when I apply my gel polish? My shape will sharp, be sharp and perfect until I apply the gel polish. This is an excellent question and you guys are definitely going to see this more as we get into artificial nails because the longer the nail I say the more exaggerated this effect is. Okay, so when you are applying your gel polish, if this is my nail here and this is my brush on my gel polish, if you have a very high angle on your gel polish brush, whether it's the one in the bottle or you're using a gel brush, you're gonna be ending up pulling the product down the nail and then scraping it off of the tip. And when you do this, you're actually scraping gel from here and depositing it right here on the tip of the nail, okay? So in order to kind of get a nice smoother application that doesn't bulk up on the tip or the sides of the nail, you actually wanna keep your brush a little bit more parallel and don't push into the gel, just float the gel. No matter how thin the coats are, you wanna float the gel over the nail in one nice even movement. And you can see if I do this, it stays even over the entire surface of the nail. I'm not scraping and then depositing a hump here. I can always tell people with a too high of a brush angle because they have a hump here, they have a dip, and then it humps up again at the end of the nail. So keep your brush more parallel to the nail like this when you're applying. Smoother, softer application. Don't dig your brush into the nail like you would with nail polish. You wanna kind of float your brush over the surface of the gel. It'll allow it to self-level. The other thing you can do is if you do have too much gel right on the end of the free edge, is take, scrape off most of the product on your brush, touch the gel on the very tip of the nail and just drag it back like this, kind of flicking the gel back into the center of the nail. It'll self-level again and it'll be much thinner at the tip of the nail and it'll be a much nicer looking application, okay? Or you can also turn the finger upside down and allow gravity to get it back into this center part of your nail like that. I hope that helps. How can I prevent that? Oh, sorry, next question. Does gel polish get old or go bad in the bottle? Yes, it can, and it absolutely depends on the manufacturer. So every gel, and let's see, I'll just pull one out of my, my, my drawer here. Every gel should have a little, um, a little icon, and I'll put a picture of what it looks like, a little icon of like a jar. I think this is international, so hopefully it applies to every single country, because I think the standards are the same everywhere. It should have like a little like cosmetic jar icon that has a number and then M next to it. And that tells you how many months that this is good for after opening, okay? So this one says 36 months. So this is good for three years before the manufacturer is gonna say, hey, we can't guarantee the product anymore after three years of use, okay? Um, so I have had gels in my drawer for five years that are still great, but the important thing to understand is that the manufacturer is only going to guarantee this for 36 months because after that, things are gonna start to age. Um, and it's just like anything, almost everything in our world has a shelf life except for Twinkies. And so you want to make sure that you're keeping track of that shelf life and just make sure that you're keeping things fresh. Um, I have noticed that even if a gel works, like it cures and everything is fine, I have noticed that like it'll get thicker um, or sometimes the color will get a little bit like it won't be as bright as it used to be. Um, I've also seen gels yellow over time and um, I would say, yeah, definitely you can, there is a shelf life for every product that we use, but you can absolutely extend that shelf life, but it also depends on the formula. Those formulas, like I mentioned, that have nitrocellulose, that have those nail polish ingredients in them, they tend to actually go bad on, the, on their own, whether you're using it or not. I've actually had many gel polishes where I went to go use it after, I don't know, a year or something, and the brush was all hard, it was all like weird and frayed, the color inside the bottle had changed, it got dry, it got gloopy, so um, it really depends on the formula. If you're using a solvent-free formula, they're gonna last a lot longer. If you're using a hybrid formula where it's a mix between nail polish and gel, then they're not gonna last as long. And almost every product I can think of has this little icon on it that tells you how many months it's good for. So um, just look for that on your products, okay? And you can also ask the manufacturer as well. Okay, moving on, um, how to apply gel polish start to finish, real-time video. So this was a really good video and I think a lot of you guys liked this and my hubby Herman was such a good sport in letting me paint his nails. Um, so I am very, very uh, glad that you guys enjoyed this one. Okay, this is a very long question, so I'll just read it through and then I'll break it down for you guys. 
For several months now, I'm practicing fixing dents and nails with base coat and I'm finding this method very helpful, but I have some questions. In order to fix the dent you gave, you gave to apply more product, in my case base, and yours top coat, does that affect the cure time or not? And can the cure time of the base coat affect the lasting time of the gel polish? In some forms, I've read that if the base is over cured, chipping occurs early and easily. Also in forms and one video, I've heard that if you wipe, remove the inhibition layer of the base coat, your gel polish will last longer. How come? Isn't the inhibition layer for better adhesion or the next layer? If not, what is the purpose of this sticky layer? Sorry, this is a really long question. So let me let me back up. This is a great question. It's got lots of good, good stuff in it. Um, let me back up to in order to fix dents. Okay, this is a good question. So if you remember from my gel polish application video, I talked about how a lot of us can get stuck in one particular area of the service. And this really applies mainly to people working in the salon. I find that nail technicians, we, we get so fixated on the smoothness of the application that sometimes we don't realize that that can be fixed in the next step. Um, so during the appointment, I kind of fix things as I go along. So I'll fix 90% of the problem with my base coat, but if there's like a dent or a divot in my base coat, I can apply my color a little bit more in that area to kind of fix that. Or I can also fix things at the very end with top coat and I kind of do a little bit as I go along. That way I'm not getting too fixated in one area, I'm not wasting time and I'm able to do my services much quicker, much more efficiently and, uh, and I don't get hung up on trying to make these like ridiculously perfect nails just on the base coat layer. Like you have time to think about that as you move through the appointment. So does it affect the cure time? No, it should not. Um, Cure, uh, clear gels specifically, color gels, you definitely have to take into consideration how thick you're doing them because again, the pigment is gonna block the light. However, with clear gels, no, it should not affect the cure time. It depends on the manufacturer, but if they have that nice formula where the photo initiators, they have lots of photo initiators, they have lots of um, the, the right balance between monomers and oligomers and all of this stuff, it should carry regardless of how thick the layer is okay it might take it might take you know the time will go through but during that light exposure if you have a, a layer this thick okay and all the little you know all the monomers and everything is inside and the photo initiators are inside once this layer gets exposed to ultraviolet light what it does is it triggers those photo initiators that are inside the gel and those photo initiators actually start the chemical process and if you imagine it kind of like a wave like motion or something and it can be like from multiple, you know, multiple angles like this. But essentially, once those photo initiators get activated, they start the polymerization uh, process and everything starts to come together and they start to, the, the molecules start to bond together and create, um, to create polymers. So everything starts to link together and it's kind of like this process where it, it waves through the nail. So regardless of how thick that clear gel is, as long as it's all completely exposed to ultraviolet light, that exposure, that chemical reaction should carry through the product and polymerize the whole entire thing, okay? Um, and I have tested this with, for example, I made a snow cone out of gel for my Nails Magazine cover and I made the whole cone out of um, gel and then I did the top part of it had gel on it and I used a lot of gel and I also made a straw out of gel. What I noticed is that the curing time was the same. However, I could feel the polymerization, the exothermic reaction from that chemical reaction. I could feel it pass through slower. So the exothermic reaction was more intense and it lasted longer because I could tell that that reaction was slowly transmitting through the entire tube of gel that I had created. Um, so the cure time was the same, but the chemical reaction happened much longer after exposure. It wasn't as instantaneous. I hope that makes sense. Um, so no, it, in general, it should not. So if you're doing your base coat slightly thicker to fix a dent, it should not affect your cure time. Okay, there's extremes to that, but if we're talking about just base, base color and top coat, if you do your top coat slightly thicker, your base coat slightly thicker, it should not affect your cure time. It should be the same exact exposure as what the manufacturer recommends. And as, in most cases these days, we're talking 30 seconds in a LED style lamp. In some forms, I've read that the base is over, if the base is over cured, chipping occurs easily and early. It's not necessarily true. Again, it depends on the formula of the gel. 
I have found that the hybrids are the ones that have the most problems. And unfortunately, most gels on the market right now, most gel polishes on the market are hybrid gel polishes. What I mean by hybrid is they are mixed between nail polish ingredients and gel. And um, I've even seen products on the market where you can take an existing nail polish in your drawer and make it into a gel polish. That's exactly what these products are. So you can imagine you've got this air drying capability of it. You've got this chippiness from the nail polish. You've got all the ingredients that are just like paint, like nail polish. And then you've got all the gel style ingredients that you know cure in ultraviolet light, that create the durability, that create the flexibility. And so I can imagine if I'm using a very high solvent or a very um, hybrid gel polish that I'm going to get that chippy effect because there's not very much gel in the formula. It's mainly nail polish ingredients. And so, yeah, I can see how over curing that would actually cause some chipping. Um, and again, it, it depends on the quality of the formula. With the gels that I use, I don't have a lot of these extreme issues because I'm using very, very high quality gels and also the um, the amount, there's you know zero solvents or very little in them. And so I'm not getting this kind of polish effect in my gels. So I hope that helps. Um, and then also in forums and one video I've read that if you wipe remove the inhibition layer of the base coat, your gel polish would last longer. How come? Isn't the inhibition layer for better adhesion or a next layer? If not, what is the purpose of the sticky layer? Okay, so if you remember back at my gel polish base coat video, I talked about inhibition layer. Inhibition layer is nothing more than the gel that was exposed to oxygen while curing and it does not cure. Okay, so gel exposed to oxygen while curing does not cure. That's why we have this sticky layer on top. No, it does not help with adhesion. And no, it does not necessarily help with adhering the next layer. It's just a side effect of when we cure our hands, our hands are exposed to oxygen inside of the lamp. And that very, very superficial layer does not cure because it was exposed to oxygen. And that's what we remove at the very, very end of the manicure with rubbing alcohol or with our gel cleanser that we made. Okay. Um, and do you have to remove the inhibition layer in between every layer? No, you don't because remember the inhibition layer is nothing more than the gel that was exposed to oxygen while curing. It did not cure because it was exposed to oxygen. So imagine we have our first layer, we cure it, it's got an inhibition layer. Then we cover that and we put another layer on top of it. It's no longer exposed. This inhibition layer in between is no longer exposed to oxygen. So now when we cure this layer, it's gonna cure everything all the way down through because this is no longer exposed to oxygen. And as we build and we build and we build and we build, it's only the last layer that cures that we actually have to clean off because everything else in between has already cured through once we've covered it, okay? You can even test this by covering the gel while you cure it. If you use reverse forms or you even put saran wrap over the nail and you cure it, you'll peel it off and you'll see there's no inhibition layer because there's no oxygen in there while it's curing. Um, and then again, there's formulas that don't cure with inhibition layers. But no, I don't see why removing the base layer would create longer lasting nails unless you were using two different brands and the incompatibility of them was causing chipping or peeling. Um, and the sticky layer, the, that inhibition layer is literally nothing more than a side effect of how the chemical process works. And that is something that we remove with gel cleanser. So no, it has nothing to do with adhesion. It has nothing to do with anything else. Um, Base coat adhesion is really all about the product's ability to seep into the layers of the nail plate and grab the nail plate. So really high adhesion base coat typically is super, super, super viscous and it's able to actually get into those nooks and crannies of the nail. And it also has to do with the flexibility of it and how, you know, the, the content of the monomers and oligomers and, and all of that stuff. Um, but it has nothing to do with the inhibition layer whatsoever. Okay. Okay, next question on the list, and we are getting slowly down to the bottom here. Um, okay, let's see here. If it's a clear product, you can flash cure safely and later cure for the full time. And if it has got pigments, you can have problems with flash curing. And how long can you wait till fully curing? I'm curious. For example, you're doing extensions with clear gel. You do one finger at a time, and after doing the extension, you flash cure for 30 seconds just to set in place the product. You've done the extensions to all five nails, and now you have to cure for the full time because till this moment, you have only flash cured. Can you fully cure, let's say, after 10 minutes or 30 minutes or the photo initiators fade or something? Thank you in advance. Okay, this is a really good question, and I think this question is going to be best addressed when we get into our... Um, sorry, I'm getting really hot. Um, when we get into our artificial nail services, you will be able to see how I do it. Okay, so remember, when the gel gets exposed to the photo initiators, 
that chemical process of polymerization should carry through the product. So even when we're flash carrying, we are starting that chemical reaction. Um, it may not have the full time to activate all of the photo initiators and monomers in the product, but it's enough to actually solidify the product slightly. So we'll see this when we get into pinching artificial nails and trying to create that C curve underneath. And also as we work, um, I do like to flash cure the product to get it to stop moving and then I fully cure it after. Is there a time limit on that? I would, I mean, I would not recommend you go a half hour before you fully cure the nails. And the reason why is because once we expose the gel to the ultraviolet light, the chemical reaction begins. And what can happen depending on the formula is kind of like what I was talking about with that black gel polish is it may only flash cure the top layer of the product because of the formula that you're using. And so you're going to end up curing the top part of the gel and then it's not going to be able to cure everything underneath. With clear gels, it's not as big of an issue, um, but definitely with colored gels, you, you, you want to kind of do that as you go. So if you remember, I did pinkies first. So this is 30, this is 30, this is 30, this is 30. So that's as fast as I can paint them so it's like 30 30 30 30 by the time that this finger 30 seconds is all this finger needs so I'm not really flash carrying for 30 seconds flash carrying is actually when you do it for like 10 seconds so that you can pinch the nail or just to like get it to quickly um, harden um, so even if I did 10 10 here 10 here 10 here by the time I get with this finger this one has had 30 because the whole hand is going into the lamp does that make sense? So this finger has had 10 seconds, then this is now 20 and 10, and now this is 30, 20, and 10. Does that make sense? So by the time I get to this finger, this one has had 40 seconds, 20, 30 seconds, 20 seconds, 10 seconds. And then by the time I get to the thumb, now it's 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 seconds, okay? So by the time I get to the thumb, I usually will fully cure the hand, or I'll fully cure the thumbs, depending on how I'm working. Um, and depending on how long my gel needs to cure. And so you do get some over curing on this one, but you get the perfect cure on this. Does that make sense? And I don't really care about over curing these fingers because they're not dominant fingers. And so even if there is that slight brittleness or that slight whatever effect of over curing it, it's not gonna matter on your pinky and your ring finger. These are the ones that get used the most. So that's why a flash cure is just, I can only paint as quickly as maybe 20 seconds a finger. I mean, when I'm applying polish or I'm doing artificial nails, I think the fastest I'm able to apply the product is maybe 20 seconds, maybe. So I'm able to get that product going and it's almost fully cured by the time the hand comes out of the lamp. Um, but typically I do a 30 second setting and that way I am fully curing each finger as I go along. This one and this one might be over cured, but again, it doesn't matter. And then I'm able to lock in my product and I don't have to worry about finish filing, fixing errors, etc. cetera. Um, I would not wait half an hour before you fully cure the nails. And I don't know that that would really be a problem because if you're working through finger at a time, then you're gonna end up curing all five nails by the time you're done you know, doing all of the applications. I hope that makes sense. I don't know if you've made a video before about this topic, but I'd like to learn about more about hybrid and non-hybrid gel polishes. What are the main differences? For example, can I remove both with acetone or only file? Okay, so let's clarify this a little bit. One thing is hard gel and one thing is soak off gel and both, uh, well, typically on soak off gels is where you see this more with the hybrids. Okay, so let's define hybrid. What does hybrid mean? Hybrid means it is a, typically it's a colored gel polish or a gel polish system that has both nail polish and gel ingredients in it. So ingredients of nail polish would be things like nitrocellulose is a big ingredient in nail polish that allows it to, um, to dry. Um, solvents that you know dissolve the products inside of the nail polish and help with, uh, with the hardening process. Um, and so when we have this mix between gel and, cause gel is, is a polymer, you know, it's resin based, it's different formulas of resin. Um, for example, like, uh, uh, what's the main, I'll show you. This is like stuff that's like used in like, uh, any kind of coatings, polyethyl methacrylate, you know, like, so it's, it's just forms of polymers. It's forms of like plastic kind of 
kind of similar to like the stuff that you would put like on wood varnish, you know, like that clear laminate stuff that they put on wood. So essentially it's all of those types of resins, all of those types of polymer coatings that we use to protect surfaces and they've been adapted over time for the nail industry. So that's essentially what we're using. So when you take those types of ingredients and you mix paint in it, so like an air drying paint, you get kind of this mix between a chippy paint like nail polish and we all know how long nail polish lasts and the smell of nail polish and, and how it works and how it dries with gel which is cured in ultraviolet light. It's hardened in ultraviolet light. So when we put the two together, what we end up with is a nail polish that is much more durable and it can dry instantly in ultraviolet light. So that was the idea between gel polish is taking the world of ultraviolet cured coatings with nail polish and making it so that our nail polish no longer has to air dry completely and it lasts longer than three days and all of those added benefits of having a gel in it. However, some of the negative side effects of hybrids is that they have, um, they smell like nail polish, they can wear like nail polish, they can actually chip off instead of lasting like true gel does. Um, they're, um, they can actually change inside the bottle. So if you've ever had things like where your brush got stiff, it got frayed, like you open up your, your gel brush and instead of inside the bottle, it's nice and smooth. It's like this and it's like hard and it will not paint. That is because of the ingredients from the nail polish side of the product eating the gel side and kind of curing inside of the bottle. I've also seen color changes. I've seen products get gloopy, dried out. So those are the negative side effects of hybrids. The benefits of hybrids is that they are easy to remove because they are a mix between gel and nail polish. Um, they're easy to apply because they paint on like nail polish except they UV cure. And because they air dry slightly, you don't have as much movement with the gel, you don't have as much self-leveling. And so for people who are transitioning from nail polish to gel polish, the idea was that it's gonna be very easy for a nail polish person to transition to gel, but it's going to add the benefits of you know instant, instant drying and, and longer durability, et cetera. Okay, so that is what hybrid is. Hybrid means the formula of the gel, what's in the gel. And typically the hybrid stuff only really relates to the gel polishes, okay? So like, um, you know, stuff like this. So like a gel polish that's like a color. Typically these are the ones that are susceptible to being the hybrids and to having both those benefits and those consequences of being mixed between nail polish and gel. Does that make sense? But there's also other gel colors on the market that are 100% gel with pigment. And those are the ones I like to use because I think they just work so much better. And we're, we're gonna get into that as we go, we go forward. Um, so then outside of the hybrid topic, then we have the topic of do you have to file it off or can you soak it off? And that's where we get into the world of hard gel and soak off gel. And those two have nothing to do with whether or not something is hybrid. It's just whether or not one can be removed with acetone and whether or not one can be removed with filing. Um, and it has to do with the way that the bonds come together, how porous the product is, and whether or not it's susceptible to breaking down under uh, acetone exposure, okay? Where do you get your tip displays on your back counter? Mm. Take a little sip of water here because I'm talking so much. Okay, so I'll show you guys if I can show you this, okay? So this is my tip display. These are actually nothing more, and let me see if I can just peel one off for you guys so you can see. These are just practice nail tips. They're just like fake nail tips that I paint, and then I put double-sided tape on a frame, so you can see like the glass on there, it's actually plastic, these are from, this is from Ikea. Um, but I put double-sided sticky tape, and then I can stick my nail tips on them. And I do that for my art, and I also do that for my samples of colors. So let me show you. Oops, I just dropped my phone. Whee! I'll show you this one. So these are a little bit different. They're actually flat on the back. These ones, they're flat. And I just paint them with my gel colors and then I can label them. And then I have the same labels in my drawer. And again, it's just a frame with label tape on it, double-sided tape. You can see the double-sided tape right there. And then I just stick the, the nail tips on them to arrange them and make it look nice and pretty. And I arrange them by color, and then this coordinates to the gels that are in my drawer. So that's how I make them. Um, I just buy cheap frames from Ikea, or you can buy them online, and then just get double-sided tape, 
Um, it's actually, uh, it's like a 3M kind of stuff that's, it's like a little bit thicker. It's not like the double-sided tape you use for gift wrapping. It's like a little bit thicker stuff. And you'll see it like on Amazon. I can even, I'll put the link to it right below this video so you can get uh, exactly what I use. Um, and I, I actually cut it in half so it's a little bit skinnier. And then I put my tips right on the actual plastic. The cool thing about that since I put it on the plastic part or on the glass is that if I ever want to change out my tip displays, I just take all the tips off, peel off the tape, and then I can redo them. I can clean them, whatever I want to do. Um, so I use that for all of my tip displays for my colors and also for my nail art. So I hope that helps. Um, if you have a hard gel structure and then you put soak off gel color or polish on top, can the color be soaked off without affecting the hard gel? Thank you so much for this series of videos. You have given me confidence because of the knowledge. Well, I'm really glad this is giving you confidence because that's exactly what the whole point of this is. Um, I am really trying to make sure that you guys get as much information as possible to be really savvy about what you're doing. And that's the whole goal. Okay. Um, no. You cannot really soak off gel polish on top of hard gel. If it's nail polish, you could absolutely use nail polish remover to take off just the nail polish. But the reason why it doesn't really work that well is even though hard gel is not susceptible to being removed by acetone, it can actually kind of change the hard gel or like, it's really hard to describe. It's, it's hard gel cannot be soaked off, but when you put wraps on hard gel that has gel polish on top of it, the gel polish doesn't release the same way as it would if it was on a natural nail. So if you're going to do hard gels, you're going to need to e-file off the color in 99.9% .9 of cases. And we're going to get into that very soon in some subsequent videos. I've started with the most basic, basic, basic stuff because it's really important you guys understand the basics before we get into e-filing, before we get into artificial nails. And so we're going to get into how we remove color if we have an artificial service like hard gel. But no, you can't really soak off gel polish on top of hard gels. It doesn't work that well. Um, you can do nail polish and remove that on top of hard gel. Um, and same thing with acrylic even. Acrylic can be soaked off with acetone. So if you try to soak off your gel polish over your acrylic, you're going to end up soaking off some of your acrylic too. Um, how would you tell your clients that you do dry manicures when they want gel polish? I don't really discuss that with my clients. Um, I know this sounds kind of weird, but I don't over explain things to my clients. Uh, if they seem interested, I will usually during the very, very first consultation, just look at their nails, talk to them about the things that I notice that I want to fix, ask them about their previous experiences, ask them about what they don't like about their nails, what they do like about their nails. I try to get an idea of what are they trying to achieve? What are they trying to fix? But as far as how I do my job, that isn't really something I negotiate or discuss with my client. Um, I have had clients that are scared of e-files. And so I have actually like let, and I'll show you that when I do e-filing, I'll show you that I, I put it on the client's hand and allow them to feel what it feels like. Because a lot of clients, they just come from the perspective that they've had a bad experience. Um, when it comes to dry manicures and when people go, why don't you use water before you put stuff on my nails? I use the whole sponge analogy, which I just showed you guys in my uh, why gel cracks video. Our nails are like little sponges. They absorb water and we do not want water anywhere near our services. And I like to show them, you know, I even can show them a picture. This is what your nail looks like when it's normal. And this is what it looks like when it's been swelled up with water and then dehydrated. Um, I usually just do a quick analogy like products that we use for nails don't like water, or I don't want water in your nail bed before I put product on top of it because it'll make the product lift. I keep it really, really simple and then I move forward. And I find that if you try to over explain things to clients, they either get confused just because they don't talk the lingo, kind of like a, you know, a, a car repair guy talking about your alternator and your yada yada. And you're like, dude, I just, I just need my car to be able to drive. Okay. So clients are very results oriented. They're very about like, what are my nails going to feel like? Are they going to be healthy? What are they going to look like? And how much are you going to charge me? I mean, that's literally all they care about. Um, as long as you don't hurt them and their nails look beautiful and last a long time and they stay healthy, they're not going to care how you do things. So if you tell them that doing waterless makes the product work better and makes your nails healthier long term, then they're going to be like, okay, cool. Sounds great. All right. Let's go down to our last two questions. Okay. How to properly remove gel polish. This is from the how to properly remove gel polish basic method video. Thanks for this video. I have a question for you that is business related, having trouble building clientele. And I've been giving people my card and doing Instagram for a while now. 
Do people have a hard time trusting new nail technicians or think we are going to ruin their nails? It seems like people would rather go to the Asian salons because that's what they're familiar with. Please help. Okay, so I like this question and um, I absolutely do not think there was anything you know, mean spirited about using the term Asian salons, but I have to stop there just for a second. And I want to clarify something because I know there's also some people that are DIYers and there's also some clients that are watching these videos as well as nail technicians. And I have to be honest. Um, so there is definitely a presence of Vietnamese and Chinese and Japanese and Korean and all different types of people that have nail salons. And I think this happens a lot in certain areas where um, there's, you know, a Vietnamese salon and that's kind of like what becomes like the typical nail salon. And it's kind of become something that's, you know, part of the nail industry culture from a client's perspective is they've now associated, you know, this type of nail salon with, with people from Asia. But actually one thing has nothing to do with the other. Just because someone's Vietnamese doesn't mean they have a shitty salon. And just because it's a shitty salon doesn't mean the people that are working there are Vietnamese. I've actually seen really crappy salons. Oh, did I just say shit? Oh, I just swore on camera. Ah, I'm gonna beep that out. Um, I have seen really bad salons run by all different types of people. And I've seen really good salons run by all different types of people. So I really like to use the term non-standard salon if you're referring to kind of those, what, you know, you might hear chop shop, like we used to use like auto body terms to refer to bad salons. Non-standard salon is a great, nice term. I'm not a huge person about the whole political correctness and I am probably not the most politically correct person on the face of the planet, but I don't like the whole Asian thing because I actually have a lot of friends who are Japanese, Korean, Vietnamese, Chinese, whatever, you name it. And they have stellar salons. And I just find it like to be a very negative thing that their salons are associated with Asian salons. And so I don't like using that. I like referring to the bad ones as non-standard because they could be run by any type of person. And then the regular ones are just your, your, you know, your spas or your nice salons or whatever, your professional salons, etc. Okay, just to put that out there, that's Liz's little politically correctness for the day only because it's one of my pet peeves and I know that it has a negative impact on our industry. And actually, if you guys are interested in the history of how Vietnamese salons became so popular here in the United States, I'll give you a little uh, history lesson for the day, just as a little bonus. Um, so, Tippi Hedren, and if you guys have ever seen the Alfred Hitchcock movie, The Birds, which is way back when, I actually love that movie so much. It's one of my favorite movies. I'm a big Alfred Hitchcock fan. Um, it's a black and white movie that's really creepy about birds that come and attack people. You should definitely watch it if you haven't seen it. And it's so funny to watch it now because back when it was made, it was considered a horror film. And now when you watch it, it is the funniest thing ever. But it's a really good movie. Alfred Hitchcock was a genius. So the star of that movie is a woman named Tippi Hedren. And Tippi Hedren is a famous Hollywood actress. And during, uh, right after Vietnam, when there was all these Vietnam refugees, she actually had a traveling manicure. She was obsessed with her nails. And Tippi Hedren went um, as a philanthropist to go work with Vietnam refugees over in Vietnam. And she brought her traveling manicurist. And then she realized, hey, I could teach these refugees a marketable skill, which is doing nails. And this is back right after Vietnam. So Tippi Hedren actually introduced nail services to the Vietnamese. And when they started coming over after Vietnam and immigrating into the US to escape all of the stuff that was happening with Vietnam, which Vietnam was just a horrific, horrific war on both sides. Um, I just think that it was, it was one of those things where it was being taught as a marketable skill to the, the, the people as a, something that they could do to start their life over. And so that's actually how the whole Vietnamese salon thing started is when they immigrated you know, through like California and all that, when they started coming over from Vietnam, they brought with them their skills that they had learned through the grapevine of Tippi Hedren starting it with her traveling manicurist. And actually to this day, um, they celebrate Tippi Hedren as the founder of the Vietnamese industry, the Vietnamese nail industry. And I actually think it's a really cool story. And yes, there are some salons out there that are not great, but it doesn't mean that they're necessarily run by Vietnamese. It could be run by anyone. And so 
I like to get away from the whole Asian salon thing, okay? But that's your little history lesson for the day about why there are Vietnamese salons. And it is Tippi Hedren from The Birds, the Alfred Hitchcock movie. And she helped out the Vietnamese refugees and gave them a marketable skill. And that's exactly how we got to where we are today, okay? Um, so let's see here. Um, do people have a hard time trusting new nail technicians? No, I don't think so. I mean, I think it's like anything, right? It's when there's a new restaurant in town, it takes a while for people to hear about it. And unless you're on things like Google and Open Table and um, you know Foursquare and social media, et cetera, and you have a big sign out on your door, it takes a while for people to hear about you. One thing that really helped me, and I'm gonna reference uh, some of my friends, the Profiles girls from Cape Coral, Florida, Amy and Tracy, they are awesome. And I'm gonna use an example of what they do to get people to come in. They pass out their business cards to all kinds of people, typically places where people's hands are very public. So they actually usually go to um, drive through windows and give their business cards to people that work in drive through windows at fast food places, bank tellers, anyone that constantly uses their hands on a regular basis. They pass out their business cards to those people and they do their nails for free. And so what ends up happening is the person working the window at McDonald's has your nails on their hands. They also have your business cards. And as long as they refer so many people per month or every three months or whatever, um, then they get to have free nail services. And the other caveat is that, that you get to do whatever you want on their nails to advertise your services. But you can imagine someone passing your, your McDonald's with these awesome nails. You're gonna go, oh my God, I love your nails. Where'd you get them done? And they whip out your business card and go, this is where I get them. I get them at Liz, Liz's place, the nail hub, and she's awesome and you should totally book an appointment with her. And there you go, and that's your word of mouth. So I don't think it's that people are anxious to try or you know have anxiety about trying new places. I think it's more about just getting yourself out there. And it, it does take several times. I mean, I am the same. I might see a place that's new and I'm like, oh cool, there's a new place. And then I don't go. And then I drive by it again and I'm like, oh cool, that new place that I keep wanting to try. And then I don't go. And then like maybe the third or fourth time, I'm like, I'm finally gonna try that new place. So you can imagine it takes probably three or four you know, pounding on the head to get people to try you. And if you are very, very diligent about it, you will slowly grow your client book. And word of mouth is so important. Once you get those people in your door also, be sure to incentivize your current clients to spread the word about you. You can give your your clients business cards with special codes on them, you know, or tell, tell the person to mention that client's name. Give your clients free services if they're referring you business. So you wanna create that snowball effect, get the word out, incentivize people to spread the word, and then you'll see that over time, your clientele will grow, absolutely. That's um, a good tip. Thank you so much. Do you have any recommendations on how to help heal natural nails when they were when they have been overfiled and overworked from extensions, nail art, et cetera, or just what to use to perfect, protect natural nails while growing out the damage? Okay, I actually have an excellent product recommendation for all of you, um, and I do have, uh, I'm gonna include this as a tutorial here on this channel. This is one of the few times you guys are gonna see me recommend a very specific product because this does not exist anywhere else. There is no other manufacturer on the planet that makes something that works this well or actually repairs nails from the inside out, okay? So I'm gonna tell you guys about IBX. This is awesome. IBX is the only system I have found that actually repairs natural nails, and it works by going inside the nail plate and filling in all of those pits and holes and empty spaces in the nail plate and fertilizing the nail plate from the inside out, okay? I love IBX. I use it under every single service, and I haven't talked about it until this point because I really wanted to make sure that you guys weren't like trying to do 50 million steps before you were putting your gel polish on. I just wanted to keep it super simple, right? Like they say, keep it simple, stupid. I'm trying to keep it simple, stupid, okay? So I am definitely gonna show you guys how to use IBX in one of my upcoming videos. It is really, really cool. It allows people to never have to take breaks from their nail services. It helps heal damaged nails. It helps prevent damage on nails. Um, it just keeps nails happy, healthy, awesome, and it works under anything. You can use it on any nail under any service because it's something that goes inside the actual nail plate and becomes part of the nail plate permanently. So it doesn't matter whether you use acrylic, gel, nail polish, gel polish, dip powder, whatever. IBX is something you can incorporate. Um, so I will definitely be doing that soon. 
and I just think IBX is awesome, okay? So um, that is all I have for today, guys. Thank you so much for tuning in. This is probably the longest video I have done to date, but I think it's really important to give you guys this information to answer these questions. You guys asked me amazing questions. Please continue to ask me questions. I love it, I love it, I love it. And um, I think this is gonna be great. I'm just so excited about all the feedback I've been getting from all of you. I've seen so many positive responses. I've seen that these videos are helping you. That makes me feel so happy. That makes me feel like if I die tomorrow, I will have given the world something. I will have you know, fulfilled a purpose in my life. And that's exactly why I am doing all of this is because I think it's so important for people to understand what they're doing, to be able to live their passions and, um, and I know there's some haters out there that don't agree with me teaching the public, but what's funny is inside of all of you who are watching my videos are clients, DIYers, professional nail technicians, students, just random peeps watching my videos. And I think sharing information is the most important thing we can do while we're here. So keep the questions coming. I'm going to continue sharing what I know and, uh, more to come soon. All right. Bye guys.